In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our presentation we're going to be giving on ESNE Radio of a 12-week program which I'll be giving a talk Twelve programs in a row. This program will be dedicated to getting to know better and better the sublime gift of the Most Holy Eucharist. We'll be talking about Holy Mass. We'll be talking also about Holy Communion. We're talking about The conditions to receive Holy Communion. We'll also be talking about what the saints said in Holy Communion. We'll even be going through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So it's going to be a wonderful 12 programs that I'll be transmitting also on my Facebook every Monday. And here in Los Angeles from 7.30 to about 8.30. So as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. We want to start off always with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Because Mary indeed is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. When we pray the Hail Holy Queen at the end of the rosary, we always conclude by invoking Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So my friends, as we embark upon this new adventure, in which we're going to try to get to know the Mass, love the Mass, live the Mass, and try to get people to come back to the Mass, let's start off our prayer together, inviting Mary to be with us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, my friends, in Jesus and Mary. Let's invite to be with us also our spiritual director. Our spiritual director, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. We never give a, a talk, a conference, a homily, a presentation, a lecture without starting off with Mary who's the mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. And then we invite our spiritual director to be with us. And our spiritual director, our spiritual director, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. For us to get to know the Mass, we want to ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten our intellects. The Holy Spirit has many different titles. Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Holy Spirit 
It is also known as the sanctifier. He who helps us to grow in holiness. The Holy Spirit is also known as the consoler. In the midst of the trials, the tribulations, the desolations that we all have to go through, we want to invoke the Holy Spirit. to be with us and to console us in our moments of, of suffering. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. One of the best things we can do to get light is to go to Mass and receive communion with a lot of love because we receive the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ. And he gives our minds a lot of light. St. Paul says, put on the mind of Christ. And St. Paul says, you have the mind of Christ. And then the Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master or teacher. We read in the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 8. St. Paul says, We don't know how to pray as we ought. But good news. The Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Abba, which means Daddy or, or Father. So let's ask the Holy Spirit, also known in the sequence that we pray on Pentecost, who is the sweet guest of our souls, to be with us. To be with us. So let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit. And they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we welcome you all to uh, a 
week program which all of us are going to try to get to know better and better the holy sacrifice of the mass to encourage all of the viewers starting today as we launch this new program I will pray for all of you and I will offer a novena for all of you so starting today novena which means nine every day for nine days when I celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass I'll place all of you your family and your intentions on the altar with the specific intention that we will go deeper and deeper into our knowledge and love for the holy sacrifice of the mass there will be posted every one of these programs an article that I have written on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass or Communion everything related to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass so today you'll receive after my presentation a blog article that I wrote about a week ago and the title is The Sublime Mystery of the Holy Mass and the essence of this article is to go through what some of the saints have said what some of the saints have said about the holy sacrifice of the mass but I thought today what I would do before going through some of the sublime sayings of some of the lives of the saints I thought I'd start off with something very simple very simple related to Mass and Holy Communion and I'll try to answer this question with the help of the angels and saints so that all of us have the greatest clarity on this all-important catechetical question and it's this what are my friends the conditions that the church requires for someone to receive Holy Communion we'll try to address this topic then we'll listen to what some of the saints have said on the sublime ineffable reality of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and Communion so if I were to ask you what are the canonical requirements for someone to receive Holy Communion what would you respond all right so let's go through the three fundamental requirements to receive Holy Communion number one number one is that we have to understand understand what Holy Communion is and not only understand what Holy Communion is but we have to believe it I'll explain 
If you ask many Catholics what Holy Communion is, many of them don't know. I sometimes hear this, I'm going to go up and get the bread. That really, that really irks me. I'm going to go to Mass and I'm going to go up and get the bread. That's a, that's a sign that the person may not really understand what he or she is receiving. I have not, I'm going to go up and get the bread. My response is, if you want to go get the bread, Go to the supermarket. Go to Vons. Go to Food for Less. Sorry, we have no bread here. So that's an indication of a widespread ignorance among many Catholics. I'm going to go up and get the bread. We're going to receive our Lord, God himself. And all of us should know these four words. These four words related to what Holy Communion is. And you don't say, I'm going to go up and get the bread. I'm, you're going to say, I'm going to receive Holy Communion. That's proper vocabulary. I'm going to receive Holy Communion. Holy Communion, these are the four words. Holy Communion is truly the body the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Try to memorize those, those four words for today in our first class. I'm going to receive Holy Communion, and I'm going to receive the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, for anyone to receive Holy Communion, he or she has to understand that as well as to believe it. I said those two things, understand as well as to believe. Let me give you an example. About 25 years ago, one of my brothers had proposed to a woman marriage. And this woman was a very good woman. However, she was an Episcopalian. In England, they're called the Anglicans. So my brother was going to get married to this, this woman. And they're going to get married in the church. This is called a mixed marriage. So I was a young priest, and I thought, well, I'll sit down and talk with her, and I'll be able to convince her to become a Catholic. I was somewhat naive, thinking that it wouldn't be too difficult. I have a degree in theology. I was ordained by the Pope. I could probably do it. So when I traveled from California to New Hampshire, where they live, I had a conversation with her. And the, the gist of the conversation was this. It was all based on John chapter 6. 
It's, this is called the Bread of Life Discourse. I asked her, do you believe that in Holy Mass that once the priest lifts up the host and the chalice that is transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That that host that looks like bread is really no longer bread. It's really the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. She said, with great sincerity, she said, no, I believe it's just a symbol. So I backed off. Because it came to the keen awareness of the fact that she did not have faith. So they were married in the Catholic Church and she remained a Protestant. But my relatives were praying a lot for her. And someone gave her the book of Scott Hahn, The Supper of the Lamb, which is based on the Mass and the Eucharist and how the last book of the Bible called Revelation or Apocalypse goes through all the different symbols in the book of Revelation that points to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For example, the lamb that is slaughtered is symbolic of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world that we say in the Mass. So my sister-in-law was reading this book very attentively. She was a real thinker. She came across a passage where Scott Hahn commenting on John chapter 6 in which Jesus says, He who does not eat my body or drink my blood will not have everlasting life. It was like a lightning flash he illuminated her mind. And she felt, well if I do not eat the body and blood of Christ, which Jesus says, he is the bread of life, and that's what the Catholics believe, then I may not be saved. God gave her the gift of faith in that moment. She went to the nearby parish. She went to the catechetical program for adults and she was received into full communion with the church making her first communion and confirmation because she was already baptized and now she and my brother have four children who are baptized and raised as Catholics I think it's a beautiful story but I tell you that story because We're entering into the explanation of the sublime mystery of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And the Church has these three requirements that must be met if we can receive Holy Communion. So the first is we have to understand what Holy Communion is 
not simply intellectually, but also we have to believe. We have to believe that that host, consecrated host, that you go out to receive, it's not simply a symbol. We call it the real presence. We call it the real presence that Holy Communion is truly and substantially. Remember those four words. Truly and substantially the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. By the way, my friends, why is it that almost all parishes in the United States as well as in Mexico and the Philippines most parishes, most parishes require two years of catechetical instruction why? so that those children after two years will have a very clear understanding that a holy sacrifice of the Mass on Sunday is the most important hour of the week. That once they do make their Holy Communion, their first Holy Communion, then they are called by Jesus to come and to receive Him into the depths of their souls. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Lest you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. For that reason, a two-year catechetical program is required in almost all parishes throughout the country. All right. The second condition. The second condition, and this is an ecclesiastical law that can be, be abrogated or changed according to the, the Holy See. And it's this. And I notice there's a lot of confusion on this. is that before receiving Holy Communion we're all required to fast the Eucharistic fast now how long is the Eucharistic fast? It's interesting that this has changed through the years. When my mother was a little girl, my mother and father were children, the Eucharistic fast was from 12 midnight on. That was a long fast. So from 12 midnight on, You couldn't eat anything. I remember that Saturday evening my father would be playing poker with some of his friends and all of his, almost all of his friends were Catholics. So at 12 midnight if they're having maybe a sandwich or some peanuts or some potato chips, some snack, at that time they'd all stop eating because they wanted to receive communion in the Mass that following day. Remember that as a child. This would be 55 years ago. But then it was changed to three hours. 
remember as a child, yeah, it was when I was a child, it was actually three hours. Now, the Eucharistic fast, my friends, the Eucharistic fast, my friends, is just one hour. That's all, just one hour. So let me explain this. Okay, let's try to create the scenario. Okay, it's it's Sunday. And say you're going to the the eight o'clock mass in the morning on Sunday. Now if you're having you're having some breakfast before the eight o'clock mass. Say you're you're finishing your cup of coffee and your donut, whatever it might be, at seven thirty you could still receive communion. Because the Mass starts at 8. The priest gives maybe a 10-minute homily. The choir is singing. And they're actually giving out communion at 8.40. So you already have 70 minutes from when you're finishing your breakfast. Until you're actually receiving Holy Communion. I think I'm clear on that. I think I'm clear on that. Okay, let's uh, let's elaborate on this a little bit more because we should have clarity as to what are the requirements to receive Holy Communion. Because my friends, the greatest action we can do in our lives is to go to Mass and receive Holy Communion with love. That's one of the primary purposes of this conversation with you. The greatest action you can do in your life is to go to Mass and receive Holy Communion with great love. And receive Holy Communion with great love. Because, my friends, our salvation depends upon what I'm talking about. Jesus says in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Let me, in specifying some other details on the one hour fast, Some people will say, but what, Father, what about, what about medicine? If I have medicine before the hour has expired, can I still receive Holy Communion? And the response is yes. The church is mater e magistra, which means the church is both mother and teacher. The church is both mother and teacher. So if you have to take medicine because of some type of ailment, then that's not breaking the fast. But also, you are allowed to drink water before receiving Holy Communion. Even something like you got a cough, a cough drop would be considered medicine. You can you can have that also. I think I'm explaining myself very clearly, but I tell you there's a lot of confusion on this. A lot. You'd be surprised.
All right. Now, another question related to the Eucharistic fast. If there is a sick person at home or in the hospital, if there's a sick person at home or in the hospital, then that person is not required to fast. I'll give you an example. As a priest, of course, I visited many sick people in hospitals as well as in residential homes. Okay, say for example, after our conversation today, I go and visit a sick person in the hospital. When I arrive, the person is just finishing eating a toast. I can give the person Holy Communion right away without any fast whatsoever. Furthermore, anyone who is attending the sick person, the daughter, the son, is also the fast is suspended for the person that's attending the sick person. I think I'm making myself clear. All right, a couple other ideas on the Eucharistic fast. A priest is required to do the Eucharistic fast. However, if I am celebrating a second Mass, that's called to binate. There's some vocabulary for you today. If a priest is saying three Mass, they're called trinating. Because of the lack of priests, sometimes we have to say two or even three Masses a day. So my second Mass, I'm not obliged even to abide by the Eucharistic fast. And finally, now this depends upon the diocese. I'm in the Diocese of Los Angeles, California. If, say for example, you're going to church and you put a lifesaver in your mouth, ah, because lifesaver is food. and you forget, then you can ask one of the priests of LA for a dispensation because you did not make the fast. All right, now what is the purpose of the fast? And really now it's very little. And basically two reasons. One is making a little sacrifice for God is very pleasing to God, even though it's a small sacrifice. St. Therese says that holiness does not depend upon doing big things, but doing small things with great love. And also another one would be if you have a big meal, you could, your stomach could become upset and you don't want that to happen after receive Holy Communion. So there, my friends, we have okay, the, the second requirement for receiving Holy Communion. That, that would be the Eucharistic fast for an hour. All right. The third condition. The third condition to receive Holy Communion properly 
efficaciously would be you have to be in the state of grace to receive holy communion properly and worthily. I repeat, you have to be in the state of grace to receive communion properly and worthily. That's right. Therefore, if you are aware of having committed a mortal sin, then you're obliged before receiving Holy Communion to make a good sacramental confession to the priest. I repeat, you're obliged. You're obliged to make a good sacramental confession to the priest before you go up and receive Holy Communion. I'm giving you basic, a basic catechesis on what the Church has always taught throughout the years. So if you're aware of having committed a mortal sin, you should abstain from receiving Holy Communion. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I heard that even though I commit a mortal sin, I can receive communion and later on next week I can, re I can go to confession. That's bad catechesis. That's erroneous. That's wrong. To receive communion worthily you have to be in the state of grace. So that there is absolute clarity about what I'm saying, I'll give you once again an example. Okay, say for example it's Sunday. And you and your husband, you get up late, you go out for brunch, and you know it's Sunday, and you know that the church has several masses. You decide to get up early, and you go out with your husband to brunch with your, with your two children. Your children are 10 and 15. Then after that, you go out to the park. You spend the whole day in the park. Then in the evening, you go out and you see a movie. Those three actions are actually good because they could be bonding the family. But the brunch, the park, and the movie that you've gone to you push the Mass aside. That's right, you push the Mass aside. And in the back of your conscience, the whole day, you and your husband were hearing this gentle voice saying, Hey, look, there's a Mass at 12. There's a Mass at 2. There's a Mass at 5 o'clock. And even though you, you've been listening to these inspirations that have come from the Good Spirit, 
you're rebuffing them and you're pushing them aside. What you've done, what you've done is you have committed a mortal sin. You commit a mortal sin by deciding not to go to Mass that Sunday and choosing eating, resting, and viewing a movie above the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We have to be careful that we do receive Jesus Christ in Holy Mass. in the state of grace. We have to be very, very careful about that. You know there's a biblical passage, my friends, which is very explicit on this topic. You might even take note of this. It's uh, the letter of St. Paul. The letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I repeat. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 explains this concept <coughs> with utmost clarity. What had happened was in the early church in the community of Corinth there would be an agape in which the rich people would come the poor people would come and they would have a family reunion like a meal together and the rich people were, were eating a lot and they were actually drinking to excess. But the poor people were being deprived of even the basic necessities. So the rich people were shunning the poor people. And St. Paul St. Paul came down very hard and he says be careful examine your conscience he says some of you are eating and drinking to your own condemnation You have your own homes to eat at. Make sure, make sure that you examine your consciences before you approach the meal of the Lord and you approach the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For that reason, my friends, there is a connection between those two sacraments. The sacrament of confession and the sacrament of the Eucharist. And given over the past 50 to 60 years, there's been a very weak catechesis that's why our lecture that we're giving you, I think, is of great importance. You commit a mortal sin, and 
a mortal sin, there are actually three conditions. So the three conditions of a mortal sin would be grave matter, full knowledge, and full consent to the will. If you're aware of having done an action with those three conditions, then that constitutes a mortal sin. Grave matter means it's something very serious. Full knowledge means that you know it. There's no ignorance there. Full consent of the will means that you don't slip on a banana peel or you don't do it by accident, but you do it purposely. And just going back to the example that I've given to you. Grave matter, full knowledge, full consent of the will. Grave matter means mass is very, very important, and you know that. So mass is very important, you know that. So you purposely decide to get up late, have brunch, spend the day in the park, go to catch a movie at a nearby theater, and all that time, all that time, you have in the back of your mind, I should be going to Mass. So with that, what you would have to do would be simply to make a good sacramental confession. And as parents, the sin would be compounded because as parents, you're actually giving bad example to your children. This is called a scandal. Scandal would be giving bad example to others and those children that God has given to us to get to heaven. So my friends, this has been our conversation today as we embark upon a new initiative I'm very thankful for the fact that El Sembrador, in, in English, the sower, over the past six months have been asking me to give a series of, of talks for them that will be transmitted on their radio. And I decided that these talks, I'll be giving 12 talks actually. This is the first of 12 talks I thought that I would start off by talking about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, Holy Communion, and the Eucharist. Because even the bishops of the United States of America, the bishops have decided to give a three-year three block in which we as pastors and bishops and priests and catechists will try to explain to the people with utmost clarity what is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? What is Holy Communion? How can we receive it with greater fruit? So my friends, what I'd like to do then is, before giving you my priestly blessing, I'd like to just to recap what we said, and then you'll be able to read an article, and the title is The Sublime Mystery of the Holy Mass, in which you can have 
what the saints say about the holy sacrifice of the mass what do the saints say about the holy sacrifice of the mass for example the curie of ours says if we really understood mass we would die of joy St. Augustine says the angels surround and help the priest when he is celebrating Mass. Padre Pio said, It would be easier for the world to survive without the sun than to do it without the Mass. Wow! Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? So I'd like you to read through what the saints say in my commentary on what the saints say on the greatness. That's why my title is The Sublime Mystery of the Holy Mass. So my friends, a summary and then my priestly blessing. Today we begun our 12-week catechesis on Mass and Holy Communion. By explaining to you vocabulary, when we receive the host, we don't say we go up to receive the bread, but we go up and to receive Holy Communion. There are three conditions. First is we have to understand and believe that Holy Communion is truly the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have to believe. The second is that we have to carry out a Eucharistic fast. The Eucharistic fast is just one hour and you can drink water and you can take medicine and if you're attending a sick person the fast is suspended and lastly you have to be in the state of grace to receive the bread of life so my friends we've had a very good conversation today in these 14 lectures we're going to really try to plumb the depths of the most sublime mystery this side of heaven. And that sublime mystery is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And I'll be offering my novena for all of you that all of us will go deep into the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Invite you also to share my message to many of your friends. My priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.